So the question that we've entertained before and which everyone continues to ask about IAC is what's your next trick? This is a company many people now know start, effectively started, grew, match, Tinder, now Angie Home Services, you've got Vimeo, DotDash, etc. But these are all companies you've had for quite a while. Yeah. And the question in this richly valued environment is where do you go next? Right. Look, first of all, our existing businesses, our big businesses that we've had for a while, I think still have lots of runway in them. And that's something we're going to continue in, to invest into. But we're, we're planting seeds. We have been for a while, and we continue to plant seeds in new areas. One that I've been talking about a lot lately I'm really excited about is the temp labor marketplace, matching hourly workers with jobs. I think there's this notion in the future of one-click hiring. And I think we've got a company called Blue Crew that's, that's making really great progress in this. I think when I look at the future of how temp labor gets into employers, I think something like Blue Crew, a marketplace that really matches labor and employers without resumes and interviews and these processes, I think is a big, big future. Can you size that market in dollar terms? Sure. I, I mean, right now in the U.S., just where we are, which is light industrial warehouse, that kind of retail hospitality is about a $300 billion market. Uh, globally much bigger and then I think this works in lots of categories. Right now Blue Crew is a rounding error Definitely. in IAC's yeah. results. How long does it take to become of material value to you? Years and that's you know people forget you mentioned it but people forget how long each of these things take. People only start paying attention when they're huge and they're impactful but they forget how long it took to get to that spot. I think we're years away from that being a meaningful contributor to Blue Crew but that doesn't make it any less of an attractive investment to us and, and again we're going to put more capital try and find more of these. The way you typically get into new markets is by acquiring a small company that fits into sort of a growth opportunity that you've identified and then scaling it. Sometimes, but by far our biggest business today is Tinder, which was Grew started in this building, I mean in this company, a pure from scratch incubation. So where do you think the next best idea is going to come from? Is it something you're going to buy or is it something that's already an idea that already exists in this building that just hasn't been brought to life? I wish I knew. I think we're going to do all of that. And, and we were just we had, a, we had a board meeting yesterday. We were talking about this and we were saying where are the areas where we can create value over time. And we said, well, we can, can grow our existing businesses and there's massive upside in that. We said we can grow our kind of proving businesses, our small but proving businesses, what we call tomorrow's big businesses, which is Vimeo and Dot Dash. And then we have these little uh, uh, tiny businesses today, but massive opportunities. And I think we're investing in all of those things for, for I think, pretty good opportunity. When you're prospecting for M&A, you are probably competing with more capital yeah. than has ever been mobilized in search of growth than ever before. It does feel like that. and. That has forced us in many ways to go earlier, uh, younger. So we're, we're, I mean, Blue Crew as an example, we bought it with, I don't know, it had two or six million dollars of revenue or something like that, some irrelevant amount of revenue. But we looked at the opportunity and said, we'll make a bunch of bets in this thing. That is a reality. I think that, that there is this segment of the market that just kind of, that used to exist, that no longer exists because there's so much growth equity capital chasing things. There is, the things go from, about to prove themselves to billion dollar valuations kind of instantly with no stop in between. Is there something wrong with that? I think so, just in that, that, that getting those kinds of expectations going makes it very hard for a business to, some businesses will come out the other side, but it, it eliminates options for them in ways that I think will turn out to be challenging over the next few Do years. Do you think this is a permanent feature of capital markets? You now have when, and you have had for decades already venture capital, and that's where you're competing for these small businesses with yep. venture capital. And then there's this new source of capital called growth equity. I guess it existed before, but now you have TPG doing it, you have General Atlantic doing it, you have sovereign wealth funds doing it. And you have Fidelity doing it, and you have T. Rowe Price T. Rowe doing and, it. and Wellington. They've all, by the way, done a very nice job, and I think they'll continue to do a very nice job. But yeah, part of the reason that that exists is because of what's happened in the public markets. I mean, think about if you miss your growth expectations by 1% in the public markets, 1%, which is completely irrelevant on a five-year investment horizon or a 10-year investment horizon, your value may change from day one to day two by 25%. 
hit a private market, you don't have to deal with that. Uh, you know, and that volatility can impact uh, employee sentiment or uh, uh, kind of market sentiment, and, and you don't have to deal with that in the private market. So you're a publicly traded company with a $20 billion valuation. If you could do it, would you want to do a $20 billion take private and, and be able to benefit from all of the things that you just enumerated? No, I, I don't mind being a public company. One, we have more scale, which makes it easier. Two, we're diversified, which makes it easier. Three, we have a set of shareholders that uh, believe in long-term value creation. And we're, we're working for that set of shareholders. And I think we're lucky in that regard. We didn't always have that set of shareholders, but I think we do now. Joey, one of the things we've talked about in the past is digital regulation and the degree to which large sure. platforms run effectively the internet. Yep. The government is turning a microscope uh, on that antitrust regulators and others. Do you think that's a healthy thing? Absolutely. I think it's fantastic. I think it's the right thing to do. Look, I think I don't think these companies are fundamentally evil. I don't think these companies are fundamentally trying to do uh, bad things to the earth or to the country. They simply have a lot of power aggregated in very narrow hands, and that's a dangerous thing. Again, not because I expect them to, to, to act uh, in, in bad ways, but because things can happen. If all your data is stored in one place and that company, which just happened to us recently, has a data outage, you've got problems with your email, your, your, your uh, hosting, your, uh, uh, how you're looking at your data, your KPIs, all these things can happen in, in one point of failure. That's, that's hard. I mean, probably not smart for us to, to be set up that way, but all the tools are being congregated in a handful of companies. I'm and guessing, was that AWS? No, that was actually uh, Google, but I'm sure AWS has had outages too in that example. And so the solution, I mean, if you could sort of write the script for the government, the solution is what? Uh, well, that's a good question. We've thought a lot about these things, and I don't really know. I don't think, you know, I've sort of gone back and forth on this concept of breaking up, and I don't know what, I really don't know what the right answer is. I don't think it's a terrible idea. I mean, another thing that's happening a right now. A breakup, that is, is yes. of Google or Facebook or an Amazon maybe, or, what, or an Apple. Maybe. It's just so much in one place. It, it's, it's, it, it has the potential to be dangerous. Take what Apple's doing on uh, privacy, um, where they're talking about this concept of sign-in, and you have to sign in using, or you have to at least offer Apple sign-in on Apple apps. That's not a change in consumer privacy. That's just moving your privacy from... XYZ app to Apple. I, 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 can, I can understand why that's in Apple's interest, but that doesn't change consumers' privacy. It just aggregates it in one spot. I don't, I, these are things that, that should concern us, I think, as, as citizens. I mean, certainly for us as businesses, but as citizens, they should concern us. And look, the other one that I think about is entrepreneurs and, and entrepreneurialism. If you're going, when you're up against infinite capital and trillion dollar companies with all this scale and all this distribution. I don't know, do you, as an entrepreneur getting started, do you say, I'd like to go up against that enormous wall? Or maybe I'll just go over here and, and do something else. And I think that that does, to some extent, discourage uh, entrepreneurialism in the country. 